Are you ready for the Word of God? City Harvest Church, are you ready? Amen. Today I'm going to preach to you a word from, uh, the title is called From Conflict to Christ. So let's go to the text today, Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 to verse 11. If you've got your Bible, you can turn to Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 to verse 11. Uh, let me read for you. It says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being, in one, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, having the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of God. Let us pray. Father, we give thanks to you this wonderful morning that we can come and just hear your word. We ask in Jesus' name that you come and speak your word to us as practically as possible, as clearly as you can, O oh God. So Father, we pray, let your word come and change our mind. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone says... And everyone says, Amen. You know, perhaps it's almost safe and correct to say that regardless of where you are on earth, whether you are at home, in the workplace, you know, in the marketplace, in the office, in church, among your tribe members, among your best of friends, as long as there is human relationship, conflicts happen. Yep, conflicts happen. But it is interesting to know or to see how people have different ways of handling and resolving conflicts. So a wife was trying to minimize damage control after an accident happened to her husband's pickup truck. So she wrote a note to my darling husband. Before you return from your business trip, I just want to let you know about the small accident I had with the pickup truck when I turned into the driveway. Fortunately, not too bad. And I really didn't get hurt, so please don't worry too much about me. I was coming home from Walmart, and when I turned into the driveway, I accidentally pushed on the accelerator instead of the brake. The garage door is slightly bent, but the pickup truck fortunately came to a halt when, I, when it bumped into your car. I am really sorry, but I know with your kind-hearted personality, you will forgive me. You know how much I love you and care for you, my sweetheart? I'm enclosing a picture for you. And I cannot wait to hold you in my arms again. Your loving wife, Jay. Let's look at the picture. P.S. Your girlfriend called. Oh. Oh, man. It's going to be a long day. You know, a woman noticed her husband was standing on the bathroom scale and trying to suck in his stomach. So the wife said, Ah. That won't help. But the husband said, no, it helps. Because now I can see the numbers. A couple was sitting in the living room, sipping wine. And out of the blue, the wife says, I love you. The husband says, was that you or the wine talking? The wife said, yeah, it's me talking to the wine. <laughs> Just give God a big hand. <laughs> wow. Common stuff in life, huh? You know, among the many letters of Paul, the letter of Philippians is one without dealing with any particular sin in the church. Philippi was a Roman colony in Paul's day. During Paul's visit, first visit to Philippi, he ministers, he ministered to the woman, to the women by the river outside the city gate. You can find it in Acts chapter 16 in your Bible. And among them, there's this woman called Lydia. And she is the purple cloth business woman who became a Christian. And she and her family were baptized and offered Paul hospitality. 
So later, Paul encountered a slave girl with a spirit of divination. So Paul called on the spirit out of her, and because of that, her upset owners brought Paul and Silas to the civil authorities. And Paul and Silas were beaten and were thrown into the jail. But miraculously, you know the story, the chains broken. The chains broke as they started to praise God in the night. And rather than escaping, Paul preached to the jailer. And he led the jailer and the family to believe in Jesus and got baptized. And that's where you get the verse, believe in the Lord Jesus and you and your household will be safe, right? But years later, Paul, here in this letter, while he was in prison under house arrest, he wrote this letter to the same group of people, the Philippians. And he addressed himself as a slave of Christ Jesus. And he thanked them for their partnership in the gospel since the early days of his ministry. He told them to keep walking worthy of the gospel of Christ, despite the kind of opposition from the people around them. And he comforted them with words that are very familiar to us, like rejoice in the Lord always, and uh, do not be anxious about anything, but present your requests to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and minds in Christ Jesus. You know, those are the words that we like to use uh, last, last time when we try to make a uh, bookmark during exam time or to our friends, okay? Anyway, besides the external persecution, there was also internal unrest because of something happened between two women leaders of the church by the name of Euodia and Syntyche, which he pleaded with them, pleaded with them to be, one of, to be of the same mind in the Lord. And that's found in chapter 4, verse 2. And he spoke to the Christians around them just like speaking to a true companion to ask them to assist these two leaders because they also work very hard like Paul in preaching the gospel. So this entire thing is the background of the letter of Philippians that we're going to look into today. But like I said in the beginning, conflicts happen where there are humans. And uh, it is not to the extent that right now the church is being divided, but here in Philippians chapter 2, Paul gave an awesome advice to the church. And I think for CHCKL, if we want to be mature and grow into a perfect man, just like what Pastor Kevin talked to us last weekend in our 15th anniversary, I think this council is pivotal as we move into spiritual maturity as a church. So let's look at this. In verse 3, Paul says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others in your relationships with one another, having the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Let me read for you the message version, the very contemporary version. It says, don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. Friends, in resolving conflict and problems with one another, Paul says, don't push your way to the front to serve your own self-centered ambition. Don't sweet talk your way up and trying to feel that you are on the upper hand, but in actual fact, it is actually just vain glory and self-deception. Perhaps, in resolving conflict, many times we choose to avoid the one-on-one -on -one talking to one another, talking things out. Why? Because maybe it is much easier to vent out your anger there and then and just gather some listeners around you, you know, to empathize and to sympathize with you. But indirectly, you are actually implying that, hey, I am right, he is wrong, and therefore you, 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 all around me, you should support me. And it is so easy to feel that kind of fake glory, that kind of fake power for that moment, you know, as a king or as a diva, if you want to, as compared to confronting and communicating things out head on. But even if you do that, Paul says, put yourself aside and help others get ahead. But you say, huh, Andrew? Does it mean that I become a doormat for people to step on? No. You may have your points, 
but others' points should also be valued above yours. And sometimes, maybe, if you can just give some benefit of doubt to the other party, probably you will be more ready to hear the person out and not just thinking about yourself. And to Paul, this is humility. It says in the Message Bible, it says, don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. You know, when you are unhappy with a person, what's the reason you are criticizing or rallying supporters around you from the outside? Or probably creating troubles so that the person can be better? Oh, um, yeah, I just want to provoke him. Lo. I provoke him so that he can improve lo, uh, with your rebellion. Really? Or perhaps you already have your own agenda inside of you in the first place. And because right now you are being threatened, you just feel insecure. You just want to get an upper hand. So you try to step a person down so that you can step up higher than the person to show that, hey, I am your competitor. You know, scenarios like this are not uncommon in our daily life. When you go for your lunch hour break, try to tune your ear to the conversation around you. Majority of the conversation from the next table is always or most often about human conflict. You know, you go to the bookstore, motivational and self-help books everywhere offer the latest method to resolve conflict. And a huge part of human resource management manages human conflict because usually next to the salary, the next factor for workers or employee turnover is usually often human factor. But here, Paul invites us to peek into the very mind of Jesus Christ. You know, what are the three things you can learn from the mindset of Jesus Christ and to have the same mind as he does? Are you ready? Number one, Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is God. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 says, Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. The phrase here, being in very nature God, it means that the very qualities that makes it what it is. That means Jesus Christ having the unique, the very identical qualities that make God God. He is the very substance, the very characteristics the very nature, the very being of God. And He is as much God as God. In fact, in John chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He is the I Am. He is the uncreated creator. You know, in the Nicene Creed, He says that through Him, all things were made. Can you imagine, church, that kind of power when, he's, when that woman with the issues of blood come to him and touch him unknowingly and she got her healing? Imagine his, his teaching and his preaching when he said that those who drink from the water that I gave to them, you will never thirst again. Can you imagine that kind of, when he said he claimed himself to be God, he says, before Abraham, I am. Before Abraham, I am. And the kind of power, the kind of stability, the kind of magnitude of his sublimity that comes with this kind of claim that I am the resurrection and life. The one who believes in me, though he die, he will still live. Friends, Jesus Christ is not just a teacher or a nice man. He is God. And today, I want you to get this into your mind. Let it get into your mind and change you. Because if He is God, then everything of your life must revolve around Him. Because if God is for us, the Bible says, if God is for us, then who can be against us? I mean, God is helping you. God is for you. Then who can be against you? And the same, Bible, the same passage says that what can separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. Because I am persuaded, I am convinced that nothing, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the future or the present, or any powers, nor height nor depth, 
nor anything else in the creation, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I think it's John Stott that says this in his book. He says, nobody, if you read the Bible, nobody that ever met Jesus Christ ever had a kind of moderate reaction to him. There are only three kinds of reaction to Jesus. They either hated him and wanted to kill him, or they were afraid of him and wanted to run away, or they were absolutely smitten with or affected by him so much that they tried to give their whole life to him. So let it sink to you for a moment in this letter of Philippians, that even though Christ is God in the Trinity, he did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. That means what? That means he did not even insist on his right as God. He did not hold on to it tightly and say, no, I don't want anything to do with salvation with mankind. Why am I supposed to care for them? Friends, it is easy for us to insist on our rights. That we are right. We are entitled to. You know, we use words like fairness and justice as an excuse for us not willing to give up our entitlement and we demand for services. But the truth is this, we are afraid or probably insecure of having no entitlement, of having nothing. And we think that we work so hard to earn this entitlement, to be on the upper hand in order to talk you down. You know, things like, you mean you want me to say sorry first? And a couple fight. You want me to talk to him first? You want me to sacrifice first? No, I don't want. Couldn't ask him. Who is the one that took care of him when he was just two years old, two weeks old? Who is the one that woke up twice a night to change diapers for him? Who is the one that paid for his education? Who is the one that provided for him? And now who is the one that caused this kind of whole argument first? And you want me to go and initiate reconciliation with him? No way, Jose. By the way, this is my son. <laughs> Two weeks old. Oh, his name is Shane. Let's give God a big hand. Amen. <sighs> but instead, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ gave up his right as God. As he considers it worthwhile to serve mankind. You know, some people think that God created the whole world so that he can satisfy his need for love. He wants to be loved and he will need somebody to love. Um, that is not true. Because if that is true, then it will mean that he didn't know how to love until he created the world. But in the Trinity, God is love already. He is a Trinity of love. The lover, the beloved, and the love that binds them together into one. And that is why Jesus Christ gave up his right as God to come to earth. Not because he got no other choice, but out of consideration. He considers it. That means he thought about it. He decided about it already. He know what it means. What does, you know, what does this show us, my friends? It shows that God is a God of love. He loves us. And this is in the mind of Christ when he came for us. Number one, Jesus Christ is God. And number two, he also became man. In verse 7 to verse 8, he also became man. He says in verse 7, Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. See, this has to do with Jesus Christ coming to become human. You know, we call it the incarnate, the word become flesh, as we always say in our creeds. He is still God, but... He made himself nothing and took on the very nature of a man all at the same time. You know, it is not like having been God, he instead became human. No, but it is being God, he also became human. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, he says, For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. That means Christ stayed as a human while he was on earth. It was a humbling process for him. So, friends, 
don't think that when Jesus was on earth, everything he did, he, he did was only what God can do. Oh, Jesus can forgive. Wow, he even asked God to forgive the people. Yeah, good on him. Of course, because he's God. Of course he can forgive what? Of course he can do that. But I'm not God. You think you want me to ask, you want to ask me to forgive that person so easily? Oh, 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 okay. Jesus did not return evil for evil. Yeah, well done on him. He's God. I mean, he can, he can do that, but not on me. You know, sometimes man has got to do what man's got to do. Friends, don't make this kind of mistake and stop giving ourselves excuses. In Acts chapter 10, verse 38, the Bible says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. You see, friends, God had to anoint Jesus with his spirit, power, and presence in order for him to minister. In other words, while Jesus came to earth, become a human, he depended on God all the time. He pressed on. He didn't insist on his right as God. Husband and wife, boyfriend and girlfriend, perhaps if we ban the word divorce lah, and delete the word Aya, break up lah. During our heated arguments, our church can grow bigger because now the church can become a healthier place. You know, the walking out of the door and quit chat group syndrome, <laughs> it's such an immature scenario that is happening more and more in our society today. Um, I say this with a lot of humility because I did that before once. I'm guilty. I feel so bad about that and never going to do that again. But as a result, we start quitting everything. We malfunction diplomatically. We cannot talk anymore. As if the world owes us big time. But look at Jesus. He didn't even claim special privilege as God. He didn't walk halfway, throw in the towel. Hey, I don't want already. All these disciples teach three years already. I still don't know. Why so stupid? No. He stayed as human. And this is how Jesus humbled himself. This is how he overcame sin and temptation. The Bible says he was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he was without sin. Because he depended on the Spirit of God. And that is precisely why Jesus understands how you feel, how I feel. Friends, if you feel betrayed, Jesus Christ felt betrayed too. If you felt rejected, Jesus felt rejected as well. If you feel like giving up, Jesus struggled with that a lot as well. In the Garden of Gethsemane, his fear and his struggle was real. Was real. If you feel like dying, Jesus felt that too. Except he died for you and you are still around. And this is good news for us because we know that whenever there is conflict, there is no conflict that is too great that Jesus Christ cannot help you to solve. But the key is, have the same mind as Christ Jesus. And lastly, thirdly, he served as a servant. He served as a servant. Philippians chapter 2, verse 7 to verse 8, it says, Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Jesus Christ, who is God, stayed on as human, served as a servant, or more accurately, as a slave. He did not just become as human, but he became the lowest in the rank of human. Why? Because he loves us and he wanted to serve us. And how did he do that? In Mark chapter 10, it says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. The day I married my wife, I realized that I had to get used to her squeezing the toothpaste from the center. <laughs> because all my life, I, I got annoyed first, okay? I must say this. Because all my life, toothpaste can only be squeezed from the bottom up. 
So, then how? Fight oh, every morning? Throw pots and pans? Oh? <laughs> no, but finally I learned to bring myself to peace. I serve my wife by making sure that every morning she has a generous center for her to squeeze. I do that by squeezing up from the bottom up <laughs> so that she has a good center. <laughs> because why would I want to withhold my love for her just because she does things differently from me? And am I so perfect that even to come to a point that withholding my love from her, and by the way, how would I want myself to be treated if I'm in her shoe? You see, it was never my initiative, but God's initiative in the first place that God would love me, He would serve me, and He would even die for me. Today, I can only enjoy salvation and serve Him because of His grace, all because He chose to serve. So what is there for me to then boast about my ambition and my vain conceit? What makes me think that I'm totally right and others are totally, you know, undeniably wrong to the very core of their being? City Harvest Church, the more we realize that Jesus is God and He gave up His entitlement to come and serve us as human, as a servant, even to the point of the cross, the more we can understand why Jesus would come and wash His disciples' feet. How, how can He come and, and He said that whoever believes in Me will do the works that I do and do, do even greater things than this. You know, we can serve even more people than He did on earth. We can all serve and lay down our lives for one another. Why? Because, I mean, God did it for me. God, who created me, did it for me. I cannot be able to reach His level, but if God can do it for me, I can do it for others. Are you with me, friends? If my God do it for me, I could do it for others. What reason I have for not be able to serve one another? And as a result of having this mindset of Jesus Christ, look at verse 9 to verse 11. It says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The whole thing is done by God alone, not men. God's way of exaltation is the way down. By giving up His glory and His entitlement, Jesus was resurrected and given all the powers in heaven and on earth. He went down to the lowest and He came up as the highest to show us how to live as humans. That even every tongue would acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord. Not just on earth, not just in heaven, but also under the earth. That means those who have gone before us, they also will have to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. So CSCKL, Euphoria is just around the corner and our church is 15 years old now. How to mature into a perfect man? Having the same mind as Christ. Give up your entitlement. Serve one another. Don't think that I'm a senior member, I don't serve. Don't think that uh, I have any entitlement, serving is not for me. No. Let us give our visitors, in this coming euphoria, let us give our visitors an experience of who we are. We are a community of faith who serve one another. Why? Simply because our Lord, Jesus Christ, is God. He also became man and served as a servant. And everyone says, in conclusion, perhaps Paul was right. The core of human conflicts lies in the question that, I don't want to serve you. Why should I serve you? The disciples were fighting against one another, remember? To see who is greater. And the mother of James and John came to Jesus and said, and request for a special acknowledgement, you know, to sit with Jesus on the left and right. And Jesus says, those who want to be great, you must be slaves and servants of all. 
come back to Paul in this letter, perhaps Paul wanted to show to these two prominent leaders of the church, Euodia and Syntyche, that no matter what conflict it is between them, the basis of solving the conflict is to have the same mind as Christ, to give up your entitlement and serve one another. But to us, who is in the 21st century social media age, where we always hear words like selfie, narcissism, I never hear this word more than it, you know, last time. But now, narcissism is like, keep on repeating. Relativism, entitlement. They say that the millennials, you know, they, all they care for is entitlements. We hear all these words more than ever before. We realize that nobody, no one is, separate, is spared from human conflict. Whether you are leader with leader, leader with member, member with member, employee, employer, parents and children, peers and peers, tribe leaders and tribe leaders. <laughs> the solution starts with having the same mind with Jesus Christ. Having the same mind with our Lord. Give up your entitlement. Give up selfish ambition. Humble yourself. Put down the vain glory. And perhaps, you know, in any conflict, sometimes you cannot solve things then and then. But if you can take a step back and say that, right, he has his point, I have my point. But in this situation, how can I follow Jesus? How can I learn to serve? How can I bring the concept of serving into this situation? If my intention is to serve one another, just as Christ did and serve me. I mean, what has I entitled for Him to come and serve me? But He did for me. And how can I serve this person, this brother, this sister, this son, this daughter, this leader, this member, whoever? Ask yourself, how can I demonstrate serving one another just like Christ? You know, you realize that a lot of time the Bible does not give you all the answers to every question you ask. But here, the Bible does give you what kind of attitude you should have in solving your problems. So how do you turn from conflict to Christ? If today, all that I said, you cannot remember. How do you turn from conflict to Christ? Just remember this. Jesus Christ is God. He also became man and He served as a servant. Can we say it together? Jesus Christ is God. He also became man and served as a servant. Let's say it one more time. Jesus Christ is God. He also became man and served as a servant. Every time when you have a human conflict, ask yourself in this situation, how do I know that, you know what do I know about Jesus? In this situation. Jesus Christ is God and He also became man and He served as a servant. How can I have the same mind, the same mindset as Jesus Christ?